Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ben Swanson. Thank you for joining this author interview with Dr. Christina Arnold, Assistant Professor in GI and Liver Division here at the Wexner Medical Center at The Ohio State University. Dr. Arnold is the senior author of the featured review article entitled, The Cutting Edge of Serrated Polyps, A Practical Guide to Approaching and Managing Serrated Colon Polyps. Co-authors include Dr. Lim Ketkai of Johns Hopkins and Dr. Lam Himlin of Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. Dr. Arnold, tell us what led you to choose this review topic. Serrated lesions are common lesions, constituting up to 36% of all colonic polyps. So we felt a review on this topic would be relevant and of interest to the majority of GI clinicians and pathologists. In addition, the literature on serrated lesions is evolving at a rapid pace, and we wanted to provide one resource that pulled together both the basics and the current trends, with particular attention to morphology, molecular biology, and clinical management recommendations. While the review covers the latest in serrated polyps, we will focus on seven key teaching points. To start, would you review a few basic nomenclature points? Certainly. The serrated nomenclature is complicated, but is worth being aware of a few key points. First, the term serrated polyp does not refer to any particular polyp. It is a general term describing a heterogeneous family of polyps. For example, every polyp on the slide is a serrated polyp. This family includes the hyperplastic polyp, the traditional serrated adenoma, or TSA, the filiform serrated adenoma, the sessile serrated adenoma, or polyp, abbreviated SSA slash P, and the serrated polyp, unclassifiable. The next important teaching point is that the term sessile serrated adenoma, or SSA, is synonymous with the term sessile serrated polyp, or SSP. This SSA slash P point is a common point of confusion among trainees. Can you share with the viewer the rationale behind these two terms? Those who prefer the term sessile serrated adenoma, or SSA, point to the convention that adenoma implies at least low-grade dysplasia in the vast majority of GI tract entities. For example, tubular adenoma, tubular villus adenoma, and villus adenoma all are synonymous with low-grade dysplasia. These experts prefer the term sessile serrated adenoma because the adenoma terminology is widely recognized as having malignant potential and thus may help ensure proper clinical management. Other experts oppose the term sessile serrated adenoma because this lesion lacks dysplasia, by definition. These experts prefer the term sessile serrated polyp, or SSP, thereby avoiding the problematic term adenoma and the resulting inference of low-grade dysplasia. As an aside to the viewer, the term SSA slash P is used in the review to emphasize their interchangeable nature. In this next nomenclature teaching point, the historic term hyperplastic polyposis has been replaced with serrated polyposis. Serrated polyposis is a phenotypically variable condition associated with increased serrated polyps and up to approximately 40% increased risk of colorectal carcinoma. The historic term hyperplastic polyposis was acceptable when our knowledge of serrated polyps was limited to the hyperplastic polyp. Today, we know the serrated polyp refers to an enlarging family of diverse serrated polyps. Indeed, today we know patients with serrated polyposis are capable of the full complement of serrated polyps. Supporting the shift in nomenclature from hyperplastic polyposis to the more appropriate serrated polyposis. In the interest of time, we will refer the viewers to the review article for a detailed discussion on the endoscopic appearance, including pit patterns, histology, and the molecular biology of serrated polyps. Dr. Arnold, by displaying the key information in both image and table form, it is apparent the serrated polyps are truly diverse and look quite different histologically and at the molecular biology level. Regarding the molecular biology, what should the viewer know about the serrated pathway of neoplasia? This review includes a line diagram which has been adapted with permission from Dr. Dale Snover. The original illustration can be found in the 2010 WHO Table 8.49. Briefly, this pathway is characterized by the normal colonic mucosa acquiring BRAF activating mutations, resulting in either in a microvesicular hyperplastic polyp or an SSA slash P. Subsequent promoter methylation of the MLH1 gene results in MLH1 protein loss and, consequently, microsatellite instability, as the SSA slash P acquires increasing cytologic dysplasia and ultimately progresses to invasive carcinoma. Importantly, the review includes a useful side-by-side -side comparison of the two most recent consensus documents 
on the management of serrated polyps. In the interest of time, I will refer the viewer to the review article for a thorough discussion of these changes. Dr. Arnold, can you highlight a few general points? It's important to remember that colonoscopies have had little effect on preventing right sided rectal carcinoma, suggesting that more stringent guidelines and or a better understanding of right sided precursor lesions is needed. Remember, these two consensus documents provide a useful preliminary framework for management of the serrated polyps. Drawbacks include a sometimes differing set of recommendations between the two documents. In addition, the recommendations can be a bit complicated with polyp site, size, and number now included in the management scheme. As the reader studies tables three and four, it's important to emphasize a few key points. One, these recommendations are based on sparse, low-quality evidence, and they will most definitely change as more data become available. Two, these recommendations assume the colonoscopy was complete, of high quality, and the lesions of interest were completely removed. Three, for those incompletely removed polyps with malignant potential, repeat endoscopy at a short interval is advised. For example, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force recommends repeat endoscopic exam in less than a year, and the expert panel recommends repeat endoscopic exam in three to six months. Four, subsequent follow-up endoscopic examinations are individualized to the results of the most recent endoscopic examination. And lastly, when a patient has multiple polyps, the recommendations are to follow the shortest advised surveillance interval. In your opinion, what is the one new recommendation clinicians should be aware of? According to the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force, a hyperplastic polyp proximal to the sigmoid, which is greater than 10 millimeters, is to be managed as an SSA slash P. So knowing the polyp size and location are essential and both should be documented. Similarly, in your opinion, what is the one new recommendation pathologists should be aware of? According to the recent expert opinions, a single crypt with unequivocal dilatation, distortion, and or horizontal branching is sufficient to establish a diagnosis of SSA slash P. These newer surveillance guidelines speak to the recognized malignant potential of particular serrated polyps. Hopefully, these will simplify the diagnostic process and ultimately lead to a decreased incidence of right sided colorectal carcinomas. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. It was a pleasure to discuss the key issues of the latest review article entitled, The Cutting Edge of Serrated Polyps, a practical guide to approaching and managing serrated colon polyps.